All right, so now we're going to go on to our keynote speaker. Her name is Allison Miller. You might see her on Twitter. Her name is at Selena Kyle on there. She has a long career in the industry, building large-scale detection systems and infrastructure for major, major companies. And BTW, she is not here with her employer. She's incredibly talented. Oh, man, and she is wicked smart. She's wicked, wicked smart, smart, wicked smart. Give it up for Allison Miller and her keynote, Something Wicked, Defensible Social Architecture in the Context of Big Data, Behavioral Econ, Bot Hives, and Bad Actors. Cheers. <laughs> That was my awesome special speaker request. <laughs> yes. Let's see. Yeah, exactly. Dramatic pause for effect. Oh, yeah, it's undone. Oh, that part. Could be a thing. There it is. All right, hello, everyone. So, something wicked this way comes. Open locks, woo! Right on the keyboard. Whoever knocks. Can I get a paper towel? All right. Yep. Okay. Yep. I'll just keep talking. How's that? Yes, now? Wrong display? Here we go. All right, cool. Everybody cool? Let's start from the top. Something wicked this way comes. Open locks, whoever knocks. And ain't that the truth? I like that last line, that part about open locks, whoever knocks. Because Shakespeare got it right, and he didn't even know you guys. Whoever knocks. So friends, foes, and the rest of you fabulous Besideans, it is my pleasure to kick off B-Sides Las Vegas 2017 with you. I've actually been in the B-Sides community for quite a while, since the beginning actually. Uh, first as a citizen participant, then as a volunteer. I actually organized the first B-Sides in the San Francisco Bay Area after attending the first B-Sides here in Las Vegas. I've emceed, moderated, and mentored, but this is my first time speaking, and so I'm really excited to be sharing some of my ideas with you. Well, we're... Thank you. What we're gonna talk about today is where I see the future of defense heading because what I see us evolving into is needing better, meaning more defensible designs of social and economic systems. And those need to incorporate modeling for the human factor as well as a renewed focus on human outcomes because that's really the point. So. Big data, behavioral analytics, machine learning, AI, these are actually all technologies that we've been grappling with and leveraging in information security for decades, despite the fact that they're also apparently the new hot words or hot, hot, hot things and buzz phrases that you hear around vendor floors. They've been here for a while, but now what we have an opportunity to do is fuse this data science with the more human-focused social sciences like psychology, sociology, uh, different types of social research, and my favorite, economics. So, and if we want to get to our goal of having defensible social infrastructure, what that means is we need to have more of an understanding of the influence, but also uh, the influences, but there are also a lot of new ideas and innovations coming our way. So maybe it's time to start broadening our own toolkits as we approach architecting and operating ever more elaborate social and economic systems 
so that we can protect the people in them. So what does that mean? Let's see if the slide advances. The slide does not advance. Here we go. All right, the slide is advancing. Okay, so where do we come from? We, we come from a world, we still sort of are defined by a world where we define protection by isolation. Do, 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 do. Okay, so you remember the concept of the perimeter. How that has changed. Security used to be about system boundaries and isolation and adding in virtual walls and doors and locks, but now the modern defender has to be in the enablement business. And we have to figure out how to interconnect all of these different systems and people and keep them protected at the same time. The vulnerability surface is expanding faster than we can invent the next generation of perimeters and moats. We've been modeling for technical outcomes and there's certainly at a lot of risk there, especially in the in-between places at integrations and boundaries. But now we're dealing with a perimeter laced with bullseyes. In fact, the perimeter is people as perhaps Charlton Heston might say, Soylent Perimeter is people. So, and we've come full circle in InfoSec where it's not about the tech, it is about the people. And no longer is it about keeping the outsides on the outside. We need to connect with everyone and do something that's even harder, which is sort out good intent from bad, all, as, uh, all with everything sort of running in real time. Um, if we don't, then social systems get overwhelmed with, situate, with issues like scammers, spammers, bot, botnets, and uh, fraud, and they flood our systems. New platforms are developed and then new exploits arrive. We know it's inevitable. Breach happens, all systems get gamed, and people don't always behave nicely when they're sitting behind the keyboard. And we wonder, how is it in 2017 that this is a surprise for anyone who builds a new system, app, device, or network? We look at the writing on the wall when new tech shows up, and we think to, when things go down, when things go sideways, we say, how could you not have known this would happen? When the trolls invade, when the bots show up, when the apps and the things and accounts become vulnerable assets, and not just tools to empower the graphs we've built, how could they not know? And the answer is we learned a lot on the way between trading our local BBSs and pound hack in for Twitter and 22 tabs just for Slack. But everything old is new again. Open locks, whoever knocks. So now it comes down to detecting behaviors and worse for us, trying to understand the intent be behind the behavior. Because in social and economic systems, what is bad behavior looks a lot like good behavior from an application perspective. It's simply the intent that's different and the harm that occurs. So we can find cold comfort in our own prescience, which is called cynicism in some circles. The foundations we've built for protecting people are built on technology, of technology, and actually for the technology. But it's behavior that drives outcomes. It's behavior that's going to manifest as the new blade end of the issues we're facing. Intent, threatfulness, awareness, vulnerability, exploitation, and risk. It's a human behavior problem. And at the same time, while sometimes we find ourselves clinging to some kind of technical purity of a security strategy, we should build it like this. We should leverage this tool. We should limit access in this way. Security isn't designed in a vacuum. We're actually going to have to compete for any of these precious resources uh, that we want to apply. And we compete for mindshare, for talent and budget, which is an economic problem. Do, do, do. So with this in mind, where do we find ourselves? Are we just going to sit around, gather around the proverbial cauldron of boil, boil, toil, and a whole lot of trouble? No, the tools we need now are not just hardware and software tools, tools that solidify the existing foundation, but wetware tools. So welcome back to the realm of psychology, soci sociology, and econ, where we can focus, because what we're doing is in inherently competitive, and where we live in the information age, competition is fundamentally asymmetric. Asymmetric meaning things aren't exactly fair, not everybody starts with the same amount of information. But actually, I think instead of sitting around around the cauldron, what we need to do is kind of stand up and get ourselves together and compete harder. 
The field of play is squarely in the domain of decisions and behaviors, of incentives and economics, and so that's where I think we're going to find our solution. So, personally, one of the things that I'm really loving is that part, a lot of my work, I live in the world of data, data and analytics, preventing fraud, building these models. On the other hand, where my head is at is in economics. And so I love how these concepts are in, interconnected and what's happening and where we can go. I have a little bit of a sidebar, you guys. Cool with a sidebar? Yes. Cool, you're cool with a sidebar. So recently I was asked during an, an, an interview of a sorts about how I thought we should set CISOs up for success. And it turns out that I actually have a lot of opinions on this. But one of the primary ones is that it's really difficult for someone who's not privy to the details of a business to be tasked with protecting it. And I've seen us groom security analysts and engineers for bigger roles simply by cross-training them in more security tools, more IT bits and bytes. But what would really inspire me and what I hope for for our CISOs is that I want to see them shoulder to shoulder with their peers in the C-suite. That's what we need to be ready for as leaders. So the interview... Thank you. So the interviewer was pretty impressed and said, oh yeah, yeah, okay, I get it. Like, uh, you know, analysis and human behavior, uh, soft skills, right? That's what you're interested in. And I kind of looked at, I'm like, what? no, all my skills are hard. But anyway, what I'm looking for, what I, I don't exactly remember how I answered, but it was something along the lines of that. It's not actually about soft skills. It's about hard skills. It's just about different skills quantitative skills, business skills, financial modeling. I don't think that's very soft. But anyway, I really hope that soon we can have CISOs who are ready to debate ROI with heads of marketing, who can go head to head with product VPs about user experience, and who can have really good discussions with CFOs and chief, chief counsels about risk. We need to go bigger. We have to play the game with the stakes and outcomes in mind. And in order to do that, we need to see the board and it's, it's, it's not for us to get caught up in red team versus blue team or who's, who's has it harder. It's not noobs versus graybeards or AppSec versus threat intel. We just need to broaden out our toolkits and leverage what other human-centric systems do, which is to design things better, foster innovation, leverage data better, and go for the win. So do I have ideas on that? I do. Oh, look, the circle's merged. That's adorable. All right. Okay, so I think, I think the way to get there is actually through technology, but kind of a different path, which is I think we really need to incorporate things like system theory and machine learning to get to smarter social systems. And while I'm on the topic of social systems, I want to talk about the, word, the term social engineering for a sec, because it's sort of um, become a default term for manipulating people, ticking, tricking people, the long con. And that's not really a big enough concept for us anymore. It's not a productive concept, how it's used in conversation. What we need is a word or a concept of people who are like civil engineers, who actually build more resilient social and economic systems, bolster connections between people, make things safer. And to engineer them not to be foolproof, because we'll just make better fools, but to be resistant to the inevitable gaming and wickedness that lurks in our reality today. And since this is a design problem as much as, as a construction problem, I'm gonna talk about it, this using the term social architecture. That's what I mean by that. So I wanted to make a quick shout out ooh, ooh, to uh, Brian Arthur, who's one of my freaking heroes. Uh, his paper, All Systems Will Be Gamed, uh, which came out of the Santa Fe Institute, is really brilliant. He kind of breaks it down, how we see all these large systems fail, and it's because there's no one who's there who can really um, assess the quality and, and build social and these dynamic systems in ways that work. And that's really important, because you know if, if we're building the apartment complexes and office parks of the future, if earthquakes are coming, we consider how to make a foundation that can survive and sustain tremors. Literal earth moving. If blizzards are on the horizon, if tornadoes are coming, if hurricanes are on their merry way, there are other issues that would be considered. So cybernauts, if something wicked is coming this way, and it always is, 
let's talk about what would be in our go-to kit to make sure that our systems, apps, accounts, and things can stand up to their own little earthquakes, hurricanes, et cetera. So I think that, uh, I think that a lot of these tools come from a few, a few key places. And so that's why we're gonna talk a little bit about data and learning systems. We're gonna talk about behavioral economics and we're gonna talk about actual economics. And I say that with a little sneer, so like you didn't imagine it at all. Okay, so first up is data. And what I try to do is tease out a few, uh, I usually give some of these things as technical talks, sorry, um, uh, but I'm gonna kind of breeze through a few of the concepts. These are some of the concepts that I think are important. Um, and what, what we're trying to do with data is we have a chance to observe what's happening in systems and then model to get to more optimized outcomes. This is usually a lot of math. So first we'll cover models and feedback. Okay, what you see up there, and I hope you can see it, I know there's a lot of folks in the back, is my simplification of a modern uh, detection system uh, as it might be used to prevent against something like spam, account hijacking, fraud, um, and even to a certain extent things like malware. So what I have on top here, that swim lane on top, is the user experience. It's what the user sees as they go through whatever flow. And user in this context, in our context, it could mean the end user of a system, like a customer, or it could mean an employee or some other system agent. And then this middle layer is kind of, it's an, maybe it's an online in real time in production thing that's happening. And then we have the back office, things that are happening behind the scenes, <clears throat> a little bit decoupled from the user experience. So the way that almost every one of these systems works, whether we're talking about spam or malware, to a certain extent, network issues and detection, um, there's some sort of event that gets evaluated. And then based on what is observed and what the sort of policies are of the system, there's gonna be a response. Now the response could just be right to a log, but in a lot of modern systems, the response is a little bit different. It might be change the user experience, ask for a second factor of auth, decline a transaction, and then it goes back and there's some sort of effect on the user, and then, and then what happens next? So what happened next behind the scenes is all of those observations and what has happened, all of those events, you figure out if they were good or bad, and you plug those back into building new models. Now, I'm talking about models, and uh, I usually mean sort of machine learning type models that approach AI, but pretty squarely in the statistical machine learning camp. But it could just be rules, it could just be algorithms. Models is just a way of describing when you let the machine make the decision, and you've kind of given it a clue in advance what your priorities are. And while that whole cycle is really cool, the, mo the coolest thing about it isn't the models. That's just out the algorithms and math. That's just the few seconds of pressing enter and getting back whatever the machine sort of tells you the logic is going to be. The coolest thing, the most critical thing about this system is actually that feedback loop. That understanding what has happened, being able to understand what has been observed and feedback into the system. That's how you teach the system. It's a learning system. So machine learning and learning systems are slightly different concepts, but the real power is in learning systems. And machine learning and an AI, those just help power it and help make it work. But the key is the feedback loop. And uh, one other thing that I like about this, something to sort of think about is, well, this is sort of almost like a system diagram, you could think of it as. <clears throat> it also is something that you can use to understand where to put your threat models. And what I mean by that is that most, in most systems, most users will simply go through a happy path because people are basically good on average. And so you would expect just to have a sort of happy path experience. But working with your product teams, working with your tools, working with how your policies are enforced, understanding what happens in the unhappy path is also interesting because you may be able to get more information out and also there's a user experience there you need to manage to. But one quick note, 
on that is that, as I mentioned, the feedback loop is really the most powerful piece of that system. That means that you really do have to understand what happened. And in a lot of what we do as security professionals, we focus on the bad events. We have a little less insight into the good events, but those are equally important when you're training a learning system because a learning system will learn whatever you teach it. And if you only feed it badness, it starts to get super paranoid and that doesn't always work out for us. Okay, next up on data, and one of the reasons why these systems are quite interesting is because we can then get to a place where we can figure out costs. So has anyone in here ever tried to uh, come up with a pitch for putting a new tool or new process in place and the business came back to you with, well, What's that worth? How do I prioritize that investment? It's really hard to come up with a security ROI if you don't actually know the cost and impact of bad decisions. So this is how you can kind of think about this, um, is that you know, you're gonna make yes and no decisions on events. Maybe you think they're good or bad, and then based on whether they're good or bad, you offer the happy path, let them through, or maybe it's a different path, you're gonna block something, let's say. In general, when you get the decision right, everything is good, everything is good to go. The costs show up when you get things wrong, and it's always a trade-off between false positives and false negatives. So a false positive is a user gets stuck. A false, or you know, your, your pager goes off 100,000 times in the middle of the night, that's also a cost. Or, on the other hand, a false negative is something bad gets through. Uh-oh, incident, event, breach. Um, and those are, those are things that, those are trade-offs, but costs that you can estimate once you have some of this sort of event-based transactional data, you can get a sense of it. Uh, the trick is, though, is that sometimes, even when your decisioning technology is right, there's still a cost. And an example of that is something like account hijacking where you are right, you blocked a bad guy from getting into a good person's account, but then you still have cost because you have a good user who needs to restore access to their account. They've been victimized and they need to go through these extra steps. That has a cost too. And then when you have a sense of the costs, oh my gosh, the world that opens up to you when you have discussions with management because you can actually do things like quantify performance. Let me, let me share with you real quick. <clears throat> one of my favorite diagrams, which is how to evaluate a model performance. Okay, everybody ready? I know, it's getting kind of hard. There's a lot of graphs. So what we have here is, imagine, we'll use fraud as an example, okay? So imagine you have 100,000 transactions coming through. That's your total, your number of transactions. And some portion of them are bad, or you're gonna mark them as bad so that you can um, not experience the fraud. So across our horizontal axis, we have percent of total, and going up, we have the portion that you're gonna mark bad is true. Now the blue line, the straight line, is random. So you have terrible logic, it's totally random, but in general, if you have a random way of marking something bad is true, then in order to catch 50% of the fraud, how many of the transactions would you have to block? 50%, that's why it's a straight line, kind of like a slope of one. If you wanted to block all of the fraud, you'd have to block all the transactions, and that sounds like a bad idea. So what we do is we try and get models that can actually catch as much of the bad as true as possible, but leave the portion of total transactions alone. And we describe that as, gain, this is a gains chart. So you always wanna work on the, on, the edge of that, on the edge of that curve to be as productive as possible. You want as much gain between randomness and your decisioning technology, and you definitely don't want to be in a situation where you are, for example, declining 80% of all of your transactions only to get 10% of the fraud. That's that little dot off the horizon. So what you're going for is good gain. And you can benchmark logic against each other when you have a sense of the cost of false negatives and false positives, because that's what this sort of ref reflects. You can sit wherever you want to on the curve. Do you want awesome 
Do you want really awesome user experience? And so you want to decline as few as possible? Well, you won't get as much fraud, but you can, you can choose that. And then equally, you could equally choose um, to reduce more fraud by declining more transactions. It's a choice. It's a trade-off. And when you can get it into quantitative or financial terms, it makes it so much easier to have a conversation about where you're going to sit. Okay, so we just did a quick shallow dive into um, quantitative modeling and using data and AI in order to improve security. And the advantage of it is that it actually it helps. It's fast, its performance is predictable, so you can have really good discussions about the trade-offs that you are making in terms of uh, financial or user experience impact versus security impact. Um, but that's, those are what we've been talking about are our decisions and how we put them in software. And we know that users have preferences and their behavior is going to reflect their preferences too, right? Within the framework of options we give them. In our lane are our decisions, but we're still kind of at the mercy of all of our irrational users, right? Well, sort of. And that, this is our segue into behavioral economics, which is where um, we go over the choices that users make. Who here has heard of behavioral economics? Who loves behavioral economics? Who's kind of tired of hearing all this yapping about behavioral economics? Okay, I'm in both camps. Some of you admitted it. I like that. You admitted it. Okay, so I'm going to give a quick shout out to Kahneman, Tversky, and Ariely. So Kahneman and Tversky are the authors of Thinking Fast and Slow. Dan Ariely, I think he's still at Duke doing some great work into decision making and irrationality. So we're moving, in, we're moving out of decision science and into kind of a new realm, not the pure operations management we were just talking about and machine learning, but into the human computers, how our brains work. Um, and the science of this just gets hairier the more the humans are involved because they can be a little bit unpredictable. They can be irrational. So Kahneman, Tversky, and Ariely are all psychologists. And to kind of give a TLDR on their work, this is the TLDR. Humans aren't robots. They make irrational decisions. And not only are they not strictly utility maximizing, the way that economists kind of hope we all are, um, or in a way that can be externally observed, but they can be nudged into different directions by the game master. <clears throat> so these types of concepts around irrationality or optimal decision making, they work in economic concepts, sort of, because um, it's easy, sort of, to see when people make decisions that are in their best interest because utility can be measured in dollars and cents. Now, we get to deal with this as security folk because it results in the following. No matter how much we train or how much information we disclose into warnings, cues, or user flows, we can't control for the internal whatever that's going on in anybody's head or the external whatever's happening. So users are simply not going to make decisions in their own best interest 100% of the time. And for that matter, that's true of all system agents. We can't count on them to make decisions in the best interest of system health 100% of time. And system agents includes our executives, our product developer friends, our coworkers, and us. So the good news is that some of these biases can make behavior more predictable, not less. And the other reason why we should embrace this, rather than getting freaked out by another imperfection or vulnerability in our system, is that we are the game masters and we can leverage what we learn and incorporate it into system design in the form of choice architecture to reinforce good behavior when, or when we're wearing our social engineering hats to see the behavior breakpoints. So here are a few quick concepts we're going to go over related to behavioral analytics. Choice architecture, opinionated design, data devaluation, and I'm just going to kind of dot, dot, dot into competition. So choice architecture is kind of, as the, as the tin reads, um, how we set up and frame choices that we ask users to make. And one of the, some of the key concepts that you'll hear a lot about are framing and anchoring. So 
what you see up in the picture is actually a kind of a, an example of framing. One blue dot looks bigger than the other because of what's around them, but actually they're the same size. And those types of visual tricks, uh, they can also be choice tricks. You can nudge someone to make one decision versus another just based on the way you present the choices to them. Another example of this, which I like a lot, is anchoring. So there's an experiment that I think is pretty cool where you can do it too. Just play along in your head. In your head, imagine to yourself, what are the last two digits of your phone number? And you write them down. So last two digits of the phone number. Then I, I hold up some object, a guitar, a bottle of wine, a loaf of bread, I don't know, and ask you how much it costs. And studies will show that folks who have higher last two digits of their phone numbers will guess that the object is worth more than folks who have lower last two digits of their phone number. Isn't that weird? It's totally weird. But the thing is, is that you, you are anchored by a random piece of information, basically random, the last two digits of your phone number. You were anchored by that, and that affected your decision making, no matter how rational you are. And so when we set up things like um, privacy policy disclosures or secure your account type choices, how we set those up really changes. It can really influence. It can help or it can harm how folks end up configuring those, those, uh, those situations and the choices that they make when they're faced with warning dialogues or uh, system, system messages anywhere. Which brings me to opinionated design. So opinionated design, there's a lot of really cool research happening on this right now. Um, uh, there's a conference, SOUPS, and some of the Usenix conferences that are associated with uh, user experience and research. Uh, opinionated design, again, is actually kind of what it says, which is, <clears throat> Instead of forcing users to make choices and simply presenting all choices as if all choices are equal, like, do you want to go ahead to scary thing? Or, you know, do you not want to go ahead to scary thing? And forcing a user to kind of make that decision, instead, designing a warning or designing an experience so that the default behavior is the one that is optimal or safer or more secure. And, uh, and I, I think we're going to see some really useful impacts on user behavior in using opinionated design. The last thing I want to talk about related to behavioral econ is actually kind of pushing on the other lever, which is data devaluation. So instead of working so hard to, um, to change a choice someone's making, instead designing situations or systems where if they make a mistake or a wrong choice, it doesn't hurt so bad. So the classic example of this would be something like two-raptor authentication. Indeed, so two-raptor authentication is really useful when the T-Rex are throwing ichthyosauruses your way. What are the fish? Prehistoric fish. Okay, we don't know. But, but phishing, right? Phishing. Oh no, I gave up my password. I was tricked. That wasn't really Microsoft wanting to give me a million dollars or whatever. Um, when, you, when you lose your credentials, it doesn't matter as much if that doesn't end up causing a harm. Data devaluation is also a strategy um, uh, used elsewhere where you find a lot of encryption, right? Because it, <clears throat> encryption, or in fact, uh, was part of the argument behind chip and pin. And I won't, I won't go there. I'm just going to say chip and pin, but I'm not going to freak out about it. Most of you don't know why that's funny, but it's, it's funny. I promise you. Okay. So when it comes to um, behavioral econ, we're talking about two main approaches, which is either changing the choices to change outcomes or changing the outcomes to reduce harm. So make it easy to make the right choice, make it really hard to make a wrong choice, or remove the impact if there's a wrong choice. And what's really interesting here is that we've moved this from an administrative sort of detection problem into a design problem, which feels like a better place for it anyway, because it empowers our friends who are product developers uh, and responsible for overall experience of end users to, give to, to actually um, create better experiences. And building it in is always better than bolting it on. I think that we can all agree on that. 
uh, and there's some excellent researches, research and also new products that are leveraging um, these capabilities and this type of approach. But wait, there's more. Because remember that behavioralism isn't just a system user dynamic. I think it's worth it to remember uh, and to think about us when we make decisions that we also have some of these cognitive biases at play um, and those, those, show up, those show up in our work in a lot of different places. So the takeaway is design approaches to setting up decisions can either add or reduce bias and harm. And this is true how we set things up for users and also how we set things up for themselves. All right. <clears throat> Besides, I'm so sorry. Maybe you should not ask economists to, uh, to keynote because now we're going to get into the dismal science. So everybody kind of like shake it off because I'm going to actually talk about real econ for a minute. Um, so framing and choice architecture and like behavioral game theory are awesome and fun to think about because we can relate to them. We see them every day. And I'm absolutely happy to talk more about that. I have a, a lot of stories and ideas. Buy me a drink sometime. But what I actually want to bring to the table and why I thought this was such a cool opportunity to share with you guys is because I think that we can do more by digging into technical econ. Even understanding that people are irrational, I think there's some really interesting models from econ that we can leverage. And I've got to do something with this applied econ degree that I'm working on, so let's have at it. When we talked about data and we talked about behavioral, and, uh, behavioral economics, we were talking about how to improve the, the game play and influence moves made by users. But when we start to get into more formal models of economics, we're talking about the board itself, which is pretty fun in my mind, pretty cool. So uh, for anyone who uh, has uh, post-traumatic stress disorder related to econ, cover your ears, everyone else. The TLDR is that microeconomics is really a model for estimating how folks are going to consume resources given their preferences and under a budget. And the basic rule underneath that is that all of us seek to maximize our utility, meaning we want to consume as much as we can, every tiny little wafer, uh, and continue to maximize utility as far as we can um, and given, given that budget constraint. And so how preferences play in is that we all have budget constraints, and so we have to make choices into how we um, leverage that, that budget that we're given, and that shows up in trade-offs. And in micro, this can get into a very exciting good A versus good B, or labor versus leisure. But any time that, that we have a budget, it means that we're prioritizing and making choices. Um, and that budget constraint is a big deal. Okay, those graphs are, we don't need those. Another thing that I think has been interesting in looking into economics is understanding that there's two schools or two types of economics, positive and normative. So positive is basically what is happening? What is it? And it yields descriptions metrics, uh, models in order to sort of predict outcomes. The other is normative. What should it be? And this is where policies come from, economic analysis. How do we think this is going to work? If we make this change, if we add this policy, what will be the overall effect? That's normative. And so uh, what you see a lot actually is folks trying to apply positive techniques to normative situations, and that's where dragons lie. Um, and in economics, there's actually a lot of well-trod ground when it comes to the security world leveraging economics. Uh, and, and here are some of the concepts that you'll hear spoken about, like ROI, or the game theory concepts like tragedy of the commons, volunteer's dilemma, um, chicken, and risk tolerances. I think one of my favorites is uh, Market for Lemons, which is about information asymmetries, but also this concept that maybe what we can do is make things more expensive for the attacker. I think that's a really uh, cool idea, although I still haven't actually seen how we make that so. So the, 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 way, the places where these concepts connect, these very basic building blocks from micro like preferences, utility, money, returns, 
um, where they kind of get real is when they bump into concepts related to risk, tolerances, uncertainty, data. Because, because even in economics, we don't assume everyone has perfect information all the time. And adversaries are really just another word for competitors, depending on how wicked your brain works. Um, and so I have seen a lot of promise in other concepts coming out of economics, things like uh, inferior goods, uh, incentive design, coalitional game theory, and those can lead to better policy analysis, which is actually a pressing issue for everyone in cybersecurity to understand how we're gonna get to better policies. We can want better policies, we can try and encourage better policies, but I think the way that we get there is by bolstering our own arguments with models that are working are accepted by these folks. And then there's of course commercial applications too. I think we're gonna see cyber insurance take off relatively soon. And classification is basically just another word for machine learning in this situation. So when I was thinking about formal economics and, and what we might add to our toolkit, I kind of took a different approach, which is I looked at some of the problems that I keep hearing about over and over again and then I was thinking about what concepts am I hearing about in economics that we can apply. Um, so for something like, uh, are you all familiar with the security poverty line? I think that's a Wendy Nather and also, um, yeah, I think that's a Wendy Nather thing. So security poverty line is this idea that, <clears throat> that uh, there's a certain, like you must be this high to ride this ride. You must have this much budget or this much maturity in order to like even be at the minimum um, and there's a concept that I want to sort of mention, which I really like, inferior goods. So inferior goods aren't necessarily what they sound like at the beginning. Inferior goods are things that are consumed more by folks who have less income. When income rises, the consumption of inferior goods go down, which is counter one of the, the basic tenets of economics, which is that everyone is utility maximizing. So you would expect that as incomes go up, they would con simply consume more of things. But inferior goods, they consume less. And so what I wonder when we're sort of looking at, at something like the security poverty line is, we have this concept of maturity, maturity models, right? And you know that as you get more mature, you do more. But as you get more mature, as you get more budget to throw at cybersecurity, what are you doing less of? Because I think that that would be really insightful and something interesting to consider for folks who are under the security poverty line is to understand what are their things that they can consume until they get above the poverty line. That's one thing. And I have one other, um, there are a couple of themes that I pulled out of some of these different concepts that, um, that I just shared with you there, which is places where I see promise uh, for research and things that might actually help us kind of level up our game when it comes to cybersecurity writ large and policy development. So I'll just shout them out. Coalitional game theory, consumption and maturity, signal development, and oh my God, risk. Um, so coalitional game theory is basically game theory on teams. I'm just gonna put that out there. And that you can actually change outcomes and you can do things to reduce asymmetries which is one of the biggest economic problems that we have to deal with in cybersecurity is information asymmetries. They, threw, they show up in all markets, vuln markets, all kinds of places. Um, so coalitional game theory is a place where I see we may be able to leverage and make change. Consumption and maturity, I kind of just talked about that related to um, maturity models. And then signal development. So we live in a world where we have a lot of negative signals, meaning we know when something has gone wrong. We know when someone is not doing something right. We see when things are broken. But what's kind of missing for us are more positive signals. I think that signal development or this idea of, I mean, I'm not suggesting that um, we're gonna put a stamp on every website or every piece of software needs to get certified somehow, but positive signals for us as practitioners within the industry, understanding being able to differentiate product quality and also potentially understanding signals that can help us understand if we're practicing security in the best that way that we can is there's, there's a definite opportunity there. So then, oh my God, risk. 
Okay, so you've just been risk rolled. I like to, uh, woo -woo. never gonna give you up, never gonna let you down. Okay, so I like to throw in a little bit of risk in, in every presentation I give because I love risk. And when it comes to economics, risk is where theory meets behavior. And uh, one of the things that when I think that we should think about is how we talk about risk. Because right now when we talk about risk, we talk about expected value, um, and we sort of, we're managing to some kind of mean. Um, but actually, when we talk, when economists talk, about, or financial professionals in the real world talk about risk, they're really talking about variance of returns, not the average value. And what I mean is, if you've ever looked at a payoff matrix, a little bit of game theory, a little bit of threat modeling there, what you then focus on is figuring out the, uh, the, the expected value of each chain that you might go through. And I'm not gonna make you guys do this whole example. I'm just gonna cut right, just trust me, just trust me, all the math is right. Is that what we see is, when folks are risk averse, what they really want to minimize is the variance between the return they can expect they're not managing strictly to an average expected value. And uh, I'm running low on time, so I'm not gonna walk you through that. Plus it's a keynote, you guys don't need to see all of those details. But, but my point from that is that um, when we talk about risk, a lot of optimization functions assume certainty, but we're always gonna be making decisions under terms of uncertainty. Anytime we're competing, anytime we're investing, pretty much just any time. And so understanding that variance is gonna be just as important or more important in how you play this game as expected value is kind of a big deal um, because I actually think that's how we win. Uh, we have designed a game that we play where there are 100,000 ways to lose and no ways to win. And this isn't a red team versus blue team thing. I think we have built a game for ourselves that is all about losing or not losing. And I think that it's time for us to take a little bit of control back uh, and figure out how we're gonna win. All right, give me a cheer for that because I, I, anyone who's ready to win. Cool. So as we regroup for a moment, sorry about all of the econ, notice how many of the topics that we struggle with have an aspect to competition to them. And I wanna clarify that I'm a fan of competition, of free markets, because after all, I'm studying economics. But I also wanna clarify that when markets can get to a healthy equilibrium, regulators tend to leave them alone. And if there are structural inefficiencies that make it difficult for a market to clear, if there's brokenness in the economics, that tends to invite regulators, and that's true in all markets. Uh, so many market dynamics have a lot of good economics around them that guide policy makers, but we're still in a nascent ecosystem with a ton of asymmetries. And while we've certainly nailed getting cyber into TV and in the hearts and minds of the public, the underlying economics are still being defined, and that's a big deal when the engines of public policy get warmed up. So I wanna give a, a shout out here to a couple of foundational researchers that I look to again and again, which is uh, the Pricing Security Paper by Elgene Camp and Catherine Wolfram in 2004. And uh, the, the work on exploit derivatives that Rainer Bohm did in 2006 in his comparison of market approaches to software vulnerability disclosures. So we, we have a, a lot of work that we can extend and hi, regulators out there. I'm excited to see you. I love your work. But um, we've got to figure out some of the economics on this so policy development can occur in and yield positive results. Mm. Okay, I'm going to skip that one. I'm just going to assume you guys are sure about how humans work. Okay, ready for big finish? Finish it, all oh, right. Josh is here, all right. We're gonna fight before he gets to take the stage. Okay, so um, ultimately, security is a series of doors and windows and lock boxes and keys, and we all have choices in the decisions we make. 
We can choose to leverage every tool at our disposal or not. We can choose to collaborate with sister disciplines or we can gatekeep our own domain. We can choose to design systems that flex and flow or we can try and white knuckle control to the nth degree. We can choose to recognize incentives that drive good and bad actors alike and design for those flows or we can stick to constrained threat models that consider only the interests of one player on the board. Personally, I think we're headed in the right direction and I'm just hoping that we collectively choose to step up to the challenges and meet them, likewise collectively, and recognize the full game as it's in play. Because it's not just about us. It's not just about red and blue and purple. It's not even about the larger us, black hat, white hat, and the mighty gray zone. No, the full game is all of us and all of our colleagues and all of our industries and all of our friends and family around the world. So all we need to do is build history's best security in a reality that's insecure and full of holes. We can do it though, we will do it. But what got us here isn't gonna get us where we wanna go. The underlying tech and how it works is our first principles, but we can't hide behind the tech when what's vulnerable isn't the software, it's the wetware. It's not the perimeter, it's the people. The tech, that, the tech got us here and it's how we work. And now we've unlocked the next level and so we need to start modeling for the human factor. The path forward is through CatFi and Wi-Fi and TCP and the social graph incentive design and competition and leveraging all of the different tools available to us, like hackers do. Within our world of wickedness and wonder, we choose the way we work, we choose the way we win. It's true. To defend against attackers, we need to understand how attackers think. But it's equally true that to protect people, we need to understand how people behave. And we need to get ready because the future is here. Knock, knock, Neo. It's made of ones and zeros and supply and demand and preferences and philosophies. And we need engineers and architects and operators and designers to make it work. It's easy to focus on the brokenness, the loss, the losing, because that's a certainty. It's all around us and cyber isn't immune to that. But what's amazing, what's thrilling, is what we're building and that we're building things better even in the face of ambiguity, even in the reality of uncertainty and complexity. I'm hopeful because what I've learned and a lot of the ideas that I've been exposed to, I'm hopeful because you are here. We are here. We are together. Thank you.